היי, קמילה, לא ראיתי אותך המון זמן. תמי. היי, היי, תמי. וואי, 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 וואי. הכל טוב? כן. ליאורה, מצאת את מה שחיפשת אה, בקשר לטבלה של אה, זה, לא? שאלת? אורייט, הלו אביוון, שלום. של זה, לא? היי. Hi, Sher. Hi, everyone. Uh, good to have you all here. Yeah, we can uh, start. Uh, I will just say, um, as you all know, uh, this is a, a weekly class uh, we have uh, for uh, quite some time, um, including actually the Heart Sutra that we studied before. Uh, we are uh, almost uh, completing one year in those uh, Sunday studies. Uh, which I think is uh, really mm. nice to, to know that it's uh, in the shows of the of the depth that we're going through the, and it's uh, really nice um, to remind you all this is uh, those uh, teachings and the activity of Dharma things is possible thanks to your uh, generosity um, so if you are uh, Uh, if you want to support, to continue to support this activity of Dharma Friends of Israel and of course uh, our teacher, uh, so you can use the link I pasted here in the chat. Uh, also, if you have questions, you can email them to me. I, uh, put, I uh, also have, uh, you can see my uh, email in the chat. Um, and just to say I will not be uh, I will not attend the next uh, few classes but you can still send me questions and I will pass them on to Yeshima so uh, don't worry about that uh, that's all uh, Yeshima, uh, all yours thank you okay thank you share all right let's start with the uh, meditation that's some breathing meditation. Now in the space in front of you, visualize Buddha Shakyamuni. Who appears in the form of a fully ordained monk. As an embodiment of greatest wisdom and compassion. And inseparable from your Pasana Lama. And the Buddha is surrounded by great Indian masters, great Tibetan masters.
and all the masters of the different Buddhist traditions to inspire us. And who are all inseparable from your personal Lama. And as always, we are surrounded by all sentient beings. We're all caught in their prison of cycling existence. Without control experiencing the endless sufferings and problems of cyclic existence. Understanding their predicament Let's first generate affectionate love that is a feeling of closeness, affection, acceptance towards all those sentient beings. Here in the past, and different existences have been extremely close to us. We just don't remember. And from within this affection towards all sentient beings, let's generate the wish, the sincere wish, may, they, may all of them be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. And I, may I personally be able to protect them from suffering and its causes. And this wish then turns into a heartfelt determination. I will do whatever I can to help sentient beings. To lead them to a state where they're free from suffering, free from their confusion and other affliction, afflictions. And since we can only be fully effective benefiting sentient beings if we become enlightened ourselves, 
we attain the state of a Buddha. That's therefore motivated by great care and love for all sentient beings. Generate the wish, may I become enlightened. In order to be of greatest benefit to all sentient beings. And may my study of the entry into the middle way become a cause for my own enlightenment. Now uh, with this motivation, without letting it go, holding on to it, if possible until the end of this class, let's now recite the prayers. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits, of practicing generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits of practicing generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits of practicing generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. And then specifically directed at all sentient beings who are surrounding us. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings never be separated from happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from attachment for friends and hatred for enemies. And then the seven limb prayer that is directed at the Buddha and the great masters in front of us. Reverently I prostrate with my body, speech and mind. I present every type of offering, actual and imagined. I declare all my negative actions accumulated since beginningless time. And rejoice in the merit of all holy and ordinary beings. Please remain until the end of cyclic existence. And turn the wheel of Dharma for living beings. I dedicate my own and the merit of all others to the great enlightenment. Okay, great. All right, now just 
start this session, I'd like to talk about a topic of Buddhism that is difficult, quite difficult. This is for this week. It's hard to do. It's easily misunderstood. Um, it can be, well, dangerous. Well, if it's done wrong in the wrong way, definitely uh, can be potentially harmful. Um, but it's the root of the path. It is so important and it goes along with the mental state that is so healthy and so extremely beneficial. And I'm talking about relying on a spiritual master. A spiritual master here meaning, of course, a fully qualified master, a lama, as I'd like to um, call the, when I say about and talk about the Buddha, visualize um, to your, the Buddha in front of you to be of one nature with your Pasana Lama. So Pasana Lama, I've mentioned it before. Of course, it's someone with great qualities and we're not always aware who's got those great qualities. But if you have, if you're in touch, of course, if you're um, involved in Tibetan society, we're aware of some of the great Lamas we have. Sure, there are other ones that we may not be aware of. Um, and you may have a close connection to someone, and this should be the person you're thinking of having certain high qualities. Now, just for the sake of having an example, I'm using His Holiness the Dalai Lama because he's definitely, if well, and one of the most qualified teachers right now. Um, for some people, it's the most qualified teachers. It just depends. It's a personal, um, personal thing of connected, being connected, feeling connected um, to someone like his holiness. And of course, there are many great other teachers, lamas, of course, also of the different traditions of the, for instance, his holiness, the Kamapa, and his, his holiness, Sakya Chinsenamuji, and so forth. Great beings. It just depends uh, who you feel close to. And you don't need to exclude anyone in the sense, no need to exclude if you feel close to one person, not to, to have that closeness towards someone else. Um, and it doesn't have to be someone as famous as his holiness. Um, there are other great qualified lamas, for instance, Israel itself has great connection to Jada Rinpoche, an amazing lama. And I've been especially inspired to talk about this since we just had the teachings for the Mongolians and Jadavim, she could be seen many times. It was great to see him there with his um, attendant. So therefore it's something I'd like you to do for this coming week. If you already have a special connection to a personal Lama, well, just to refresh that, to revive that, to make this week about this person. And what does it involve? It involves joy. Joy is very important. It's a very joyful connection. But also one thing I'd like to say before I even go more into detail, one of the difficulties or one of the problems with this, I mean, it is, of course, in the beginning of the lumber room, it's considered very important, but sometimes people don't have that connection. And it's different to other qualities, mental factors, other than devotion to a spiritual teacher, for instance, love, compassion. I think we worry less about them thinking, oh gosh, I don't have a personal lama. That's how we often feel if there's that connection is not there yet so there's worry oftentimes whereas if we don't have love and compassion yet well well we, we don't worry as much about it so i've met people who said well they talk so much about a personal spiritual teacher and i haven't found one yet and there's this worry and i i don't think there's any need to worry it doesn't have to be i mean the different levels of feeling close to um, a highly realized master and it may just be as much as listening to what they say and you get a sense, oh, that speaks to me. And of course, certain factors that allow us to believe this person is qualified. So with this holiness, there's just no doubt. Um, and in that way, we shouldn't worry about it. We should allow for it to slowly develop. But to make this connection with someone who is an embodiment of the teachings, that is so important. A spiritual teacher 
the Buddha, of course, is no longer around, who was, of course, an embodiment of what he taught. And we now have the spiritual lamas. We have these, well, spiritual teachers or lamas who live the teachings. His holiness is, is a living is the living dharma is the walking dharma is everything that his holiness teaches his holiness lives in and that's how his holiness's teachings are so effective to our mind but this connection we have with a spiritual teacher is mental it should not be misunderstood we oftentimes feel a connection has to be physical in the sense we have to be around that person we need to meet this person spend time with with this person but that's not it um, in fact it can sometimes be a problem depending on our own mind if we're too close like seeing this person over and over again that we may generate wrong views we project our own our own limitations onto that past and see them see them as ordinary we no longer see this greatness because we connect with them in just an ordinary way because we don't know any way better to connect to someone and also if we're really really close to someone let's be realistic it's not necessary a walk in the park like if you think of Milarepa and Mapa he was Milarepa was really really close to Mapa but if you really allow that closeness, which is wonderful if you do, but the Lama is going to try everything to cut the self-cherishing, and that can, of course, be painful. And some people can take more of it and some less. And so you also need to be honest with yourself. How much can I take? And sometimes if you always seek the presence of this Lama, well, be prepared if there is that possibility that this Lama is going to try everything to help you with your ego. And it can go as far as the Lama being wrathful and, and rebuking you and, and scolding you. And that is actually seen as a great blessing, but I'm not sure we can see it that way. So it's tricky. It's a tricky relationship. But it's one of the most effective relationships there are. If, if, if it's the effective relationship in so many ways, I don't know where to start. One way, of course, devotion and faith. I've done a little bit of research today. Just what are the psychological effects of devotion? Incredible. It's a feeling of joy. It's a feeling of being inspired. And that has incredibly just from a scientific point of view has an incredible positive effect on our mind it makes us calmer we're less worried there's less fear um, we feel there's someone we can trust there's this joy there's the presence of this person and even when things get rough we can relay we can think back there is this person there is this llama there is no even if we never meet this person, it's a mental connection. In the case of his holiness, you just think of his holiness and you feel happy. Thinking of what his holiness said, of what his holiness teaches, that's of course most effective to connect to his holiness. I'm still using the example of his holiness, but it may be someone else for you personally. And just generate this joy that there is someone like him. How fortunate we are. How lucky we have, we have this person who shows us exactly how to, to live the Dharma. And we're not in any way close to, of course, his holiness's level, but his holiness shows us what's possible. So I want this week, I want you to connect to, if it's his holiness or someone else, to again and again kind of connect to this person, remember them, generating well, gratitude. And also trying, if we can, remember what they've taught us. And we've just had his homeless teachings, of course. There are a lot of other teachings available. And even if they're not live, you can listen also from other lamas. You can listen to teachings. So to make a point to connect to this particular person, listen to their teachings. That's the best way to connect and make an effort to put into practice whatever you can. Take it to heart. So this whole week should be about this joyful relationship and it's also a type of communication as in like well you won't be able to communicate with them directly in the case of his wholeness obviously but that's not necessary it's a mental kind of almost like 
sometimes they use words like supplicating the Lama, requesting the Lama. Surely also kind of, well, if there's an issue that you have a hard time with, kind of communicating it with this enlightened person and kind of sharing it in that mental way and possibly asking for assistance in whichever way. Um, and that's, of course, it may feel like, oh, I'm just talking to myself, my imaginary friend. But if you know a little more about these lamas, I mean, they have incredible mental abilities. I mean, our mind has the ability to know in general. And we know even among ordinary people, some are more perceptive than others. Some perceive more about the situation, about the emotional state of another person. Well, if you take that ability and you multiply it in the form of a spiritual teacher who's trained the mind in that ability to be more perceptive, more intuitive and so forth, well, it's not surprising that most qualified lamas actually have what is called like a clairvoyant ability. And that his homeless has that, and that Jadarimshe has it, and that other great lamas have it. I have no doubt. There's too many um, examples of those. And so that they actually, that we can communicate with them, that's realistic. And it brings everything, it make, brings it alive. It brings this joy, this devotional state, it brings joy. And this joy is important. It's a very deep and satisfying joy, and it helps us to go through life. It's a refuge in the sense that something to turn to, something that gives us meaning. Yeah, I don't know how else to put it, and there's also enough time, of course, uh, next week. I want to talk about it a little bit more next week, but this is what I want you to do. It is difficult, as I said, it can be potentially dangerous if we choose the wrong person, of course, if we rely on someone who's not fully qualified, or if our mind plays tricks on us, we keep seeing faults in that person where there aren't any, or if we have actually relied on a person who's um, not fully qualified, of course, then we may observe faults and then it's a problem. But anyway, there's no need, even if we have relied on someone we find disappointing, we still focus on the positive aspects they've brought us, and we could turn our mind likewise towards someone like his holiness and not see them as totally separate. Speak out when we see something that is not, not appropriate, um, in the case of a non-qualified teacher. Uh, it's no, there's no one is saying we need to see them as perfect, but to benefit from their virtuous quality, to benefit from their example. If you have the time, the Lamrim Chemo, the great treatise on those stages of the path to enlightenment by Lama Tsongkhapa is an incredible uh, resource on explaining, talking about the relying on a spiritual friend, but it also shows you your own limits as in like, wow, can I do this? Can I go as far? And here you need to be honest with yourself. I can do this. I may not be able to do something else and that's all right. So to check this I've done in the past, this I could do now and I make an effort, I work harder. And this is something, well, maybe I can do it in the future. You may also to take uh, Zopa, uh, Geshe Zopa's commentary. He's uh, composed these incredible commentaries on the Lamrim Chemo, on the great treatise of the stages of enlightenment. I think they're called Steps to Enlightenment. There are five volumes, I believe, four or five volumes incredible resource. Um, if you can find those books by Geshe Sopa, amazing. So they explain, um, of course, the different topics of the Lamrim anyway, and uh, they're a great resource. So if you're interested, and of course, as our teachers tell us, the Lamrim is extremely important, it's a part of our philosophical um, study, and so of course it's anyway important to have it. All right, so on that note, talking about this week, this coming week, of course, not letting go of our compassion and care for others to remind ourselves that should never be far from our heart to make an effort. But this reliance on the spiritual teacher, when you start doing it and you, 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 can, you can maintain that, it gives you kind of joy making everything easier. But don't force it. Um, Take it slowly and see how far you can take it. All right. So this is for this coming week. Okay.
Okay, and it can be more than one person. It can be the Buddha, of course. I mean, even the Buddha is still around, not in the way that we can perceive the Buddha, but if it's not an actual person that we can think of, well, the Buddha, of course, is, is the, the, the object of refuge as of taking refuge anyway with our spiritual teacher. We may think of them as inseparable from the Buddha or the Buddha inseparable from our spiritual teacher. And there are several reasons why this is effective, but I don't want to go into this right now. So that's your homework for next week. Um, so please make an effort if you're not already doing it, but this should be your focus. Focus on that connection with a spiritual teacher, your spiritual teacher, your Lama. Now, having talked about this and having talked about, having mentioned his holiness, of course, during the teachings, you may have noticed, and I've, I've mentioned this uh, last time, this topic we're still dealing with, and I've spent a little bit more time on it because His Holiness stresses it over and over again. And this time again, His Holiness mentioned it. This is slightly new that His Holiness stresses it this much. And it just shows that His Holiness, of course, considers this to be important. So I was really pleased when someone sent me a message and told me they're actually meditating on these four consequences that I've mentioned before, especially the first three. This, of course, if you can meditate on that, and we, I want to do this again today, but even if I hope to start something new as well, but go over it one more time. And I've definitely wondered, I've I've wondered why is homeless stresses it so much, but the more I thought about it, and this is definitely, well, if you consider his homeless to be your, your lama, well, these are personal instructions. And his homeless says it over and over again, just to remind us, this is what I want you to do. And it makes sense. It makes sense. His homeless is actually, ex this is the essence of Chandakirti's text. It comes down to those three. Those three, the fourth, yeah, well, there's also the fourth that's not part of the, it's, it's mentioned in the self-commentary, in the, in the auto-commentary. I'll, I'll mention that briefly, but that's not that hard to understand. But the first three, those three consequences as the three absurdities that as they're mentioned in Chandrakirti's text, they summarize, they, they bring it together again. And um, I checked with that. I mean, I've never talked to my teachers about this, that his wholeness is talking about this. And this afternoon I had this idea, I'm just going to ask Jan Rinpoche about it, what he thinks about it. Like just, I noticed this and what is this thought about why his wholeness says this? And he very kindly responded. Um, um, I sent him a message and his response was, yes, he also noticed this. This is, his wholeness has mentioned them, of course, over the years, once or twice, or what, I mean, frequently, but not as often as as 2020. Yandere believes it really started in 2020, and he's also thought about this: what could be the reason? And it made him think about it, and he can he spent some time just thinking why those those three in particular, and he came to the conclusion: yes, it's really the essence of what Chandakirti of what Chandakirti um, teaches. It's the essence. It's the essence of what um, is in the essence of the middle way. It's the essence of the, pre sorry, the entry into the middle way. It's in fact the essence of the prasangika coming together here. And his homeless doesn't have the time, doesn't have the time to spend hours and hours teaching us. But so his homeless always stresses the most important, the essential bits. And it's the most advanced explanation his homeless gives. Uh, definitely the hardest, but this is for us to know this is where we're going. So Yandere she basically explained it in that way. It's coming down to the essence. That's exactly uh, the essence of the entire text, and that's why it's so important. And I'd like to just go over it just one more time and slightly add something that I didn't before, but as part of guru devotion as part of focusing relying on our spiritual teacher in this case what is homeless is taught and of course others will teach in the same way 
the great lamas would teach in the in, in the same way those three ones again but in a slightly different way as in like emphasizing certain aspects i hope i get it together the way i thought about it this afternoon because it is so hard it's so hard to understand and hard to explain the most important of those three of those three consequences is the fact um, that if phenomena existed inherently, they would bear logical analysis. Now, let me say this much. If phenomena existed inherently, if there was a table that existed inherently, you could basically remove anything that the table we usually consider the table is dependent on, its parts, its causes, awareness, perceiving it. You could remove all that and you would still be left with the table. That's what it would mean. That is the meaning of an inherent table. That there is totally left without, if you could magically get rid of anything that the table depended on. If you could, could, could get rid of that, you would still be left with the table. That's what it would mean. So it's hard to imagine because of course it doesn't make any sense, but that would be the absurdity in terms of, that's not the absurdity that's mentioned here, but that's what it would mean. Now, what is mentioned here in particular is we have these two levels of existence, conventional existence and ultimate existence. Two levels from the point of view of perception. Now, as we've understood so far, whether something exists or not is very much determined by the mind that perceives the object. All Buddhist schools actually accept that to a greater or lesser de degree that the existence of something is determined by a mind recognizing or realizing it, understanding this. Therefore, I can say something exists because there is a mind that understands it. I can also talk about things that don't exist, such as flying cows or, I don't know, Donald Trump right in front of you. It's just not there, doesn't exist in front of you right now. And therefore, there's also no mind that recognizes the presence of Donald Trump in front of you as an example of a present non-existent. Okay. Therefore, it's all like the existence of something is determined by a mind perceiving it or not. And in fact, whatever we say, whether it's a conventional truth or an ultimate truth, it depends on the mind that perceives it. We have, of course, heard, because of course, had if something is conventionally existent or not, it depends on whether it can be refuted by an ultimate mind or it can be refuted by a conventional mind. That's actually saying the same thing that I said before. Okay, it's just taking it from the negative. If something like Donald Trump right in the space in front of me on my table here existed, then if it existed, um, then there would be a mind that perceived Donald Trump in the space in front of me. And there could not be a mind that understands the non-existence of Donald Trump in the space in front of me or on the table in front of me. But there is obviously an eye consciousness and a mental consciousness that looks at this table and there is no Donald Trump. So therefore, this is a conventional mind that refutes the existence, the presence of Donald Trump. Okay. Therefore, we can determine it's dependent on a mind, a valid mind, absence of valid mind or not. So it's easy with Donald Trump because it's like it's pretty obvious what you need for the presence of Donald Trump here in front of me. Um, Okay, and of course, when it comes to phenomena existing inherently or not, well, that is not obvious to ordinary conventional mind because inherently existent or not, 
that depends on to determine that that depends on analysis now conventional ordinary mind does not engage in the type of well as it's called ultimate analysis that analyzes how does something exist how does something exist once we start going into that direction we're moving into the ultimate level and in that way well if I perceive something to exist inherently, well, that would be harmed by an ultimate mind. It would be refuted by an ultimate mind, which understands cannot be found. That table that I described before, some table that could be stripped of its parts, that could be stripped of its causes and conditions, that could be stripped of a mind that perceives it. I should be able to find that. I, I would find that when I look for it, I should be able to find such a table and I can't, such an in, intrinsic table. Therefore, in this case, I'm not talking about Donald Trump. Donald Trump is a conventional phenomenon, so I need a conventional mind to verify his presence in the case of this example, while Emptina, or the inherent existence, to move away here. Of course, inherent existence doesn't exist. But if I want to find out, I move away from that non-analytical state of mind, not analyzing how something exists, non-analytical here meaning refraining from ultimate analysis. And instead, I move away from that and I focus on the ultimate and I start analyzing. All right, so having said that, Therefore, the existence of phenomena is determined by the mind. Okay, that's just what I basically said right now. And in terms of the two ways of looking at phenomena on a conventional level and an ultimate level, I can determine that whatever exists belongs to those two categories, again, dependent on mind. Now, as I said, the most important of the three absurdities and and Jan Rinpoche, he, he stressed that he he also he he said that yes the most important is the the absurdity if something exists and that is the crux that's the essence of the prasangika view if phenomena existed inherently like the table the way it appears to us no way we would not find it they could bear analysis. We would be able to find something the way I just described, stripped of anything that we usually consider to be important for this phenomenon to exist, anything that this phenomenon depends on. I could strip it and I would find this object. I would find something very solid. So that would mean the table, if it existed inherently, it would bear analysis. In other words, bear analysis just means it would become clearer. The object would become clearer. Versus when I say it doesn't bear analysis, the object disappears, yeah, right? So to bear analysis means the object becomes clearer and clearer the more I look for it. That's what it means to bear analysis. Not to bear analysis means the object starts disappearing. Previously, there was a table, but now I'm asking, is this the table? That the table? Is it part of the table? Is it in the table? And like, where does it start? Where does it end? Where was the first moment of the table? And which atoms are exactly part of the table and which are part of the surrounding dust. Whoa, it's like, wait a minute, I, I can no longer talk about a solid table. If the table existed inherently, it would become clearer and clearer and more defined. But that doesn't happen. So that's the absurdity. That's where it comes down to. You cannot find it. It doesn't feel right with, uh, with us. There's a sense, but there must be something there. Are you kidding me? Uh, look, look around, there's all this stuff. And you're saying you cannot find anything there and you can analyze the table and you don't find a table. And then you take the parts of the table and again, you don't find any essence. And then you go on and on endlessly and you never find anything. Are you telling me all this comes from nothing? Well, say hello to nihilism. The sense that, oh, there's nothing there. And because there's a strong sense, well, if things don't have at least a tiny bit, something from their own side, they couldn't exist. In response, the present Gika says very powerfully, not even a speck of dust, 
not even the tiniest particle exists inherently. Why the particle? It's always this word, the particle, because what we do is we take apart things around us and we staking them. We take apart the table to find the table. Where are we looking for the table? Within the parts of the table, not over there. We're not, we're not looking for the table somewhere else. We're not looking for the eye in a different place other than my mind and body. That's where I look for the eye. I'm not looking for the eye over there on the bed or somewhere else. So obviously, when I engage in ultimate analysis, I am starting to check where is the table within the table, in within the parts of the table. Okay, so how do I go about it? I take it apart. Is this part the table? Is that part the table? Is it all the parts? Is it, I've got many parts, but only one table. So if there is this inherent table, the way it appears to me, it's not just labeled. I, I, it's not the labeled. It's not the merely labeled table that appears to me. There's something more, that concrete table. And that, I should be able to find it, but it starts disappearing. And then I don't find the table. Instead, I'm left with a few parts. And I take it further. I take those few parts and I take them apart. And I can do this. I, go, I, I continue and, and I slowly move on to the subatomic level. I mean, I can't do this physically. I don't perceive atoms, but I can now with modern science, of course, I can understand, well, it's made up, it's made of molecules and these molecules are made up of atoms and those are made up of subatomic particles. But do I ever find an essence? And President Giga says, not even a doodle, not even a small particle, not even a speck of dust. You don't find anything that exists in and of itself. That's, that's what it says here. If it were to exist, it would bear analysis. It would become clearer and more obvious. And you could strip it of its parts. You could strip it of the mind. You could strip it of its causes. And you would have very solidly something there. And you can't find that. Now, the first absurdity is the one that is difficult. A little bit harder in a way. It's almost like, well, the first one is not hard to understand. Like, what is this? I mean, there, there's actually a part when we study when we study the perfection of wisdom sutras. When we study Maitreya's um, ornament for clear realization, there is a topic at the very beginning. It presents to us some of the reasonings. Just a course not very detailed. We do this when we study Madhyamika in more detail, but talking about what are the reasons for the lack of true existence. That phenomena are not truly one or truly different. That phenomena are independently arisen and a few other reasons, the diamond splitter reason and so forth. Don't need to go into details. We just go through them and we will deal a little bit more with the reasoning that the I is not inherently one, nor is it inherently different. In particular, not one with its parts or different from its parts. We just go through it to just understand a little bit the reasoning in relation to what is to be established, and that's it. And there's one line, it says the 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 whatever you take, for instance, the eye is not inherently different from its parts because or doesn't exist as an inherently different phenomenon because. Uh, if it did exist inherently different, it should appear to a meditative equipoise, realizing emptiness, but it doesn't appear to that. That's just that sentence. And you go like, hmm, that doesn't help that much. It's actually Gelsabji. He mentions it in his commentary on Maitreya's text. And it's just the sentence. We all memorize it and we cite it during the debate. And But it's kind of like, hmm, well, yeah, if it really existed, Truly, inherently, it would have to appear to the meditative active poise, but it doesn't. And it's like, yeah, big deal. It kind of like, at that time, we certainly don't get it, but we all memorized it. Now we're back with the meditative active poise here as part of the study of Madhyamika. We're back at it. But it's not just saying, well, if it existed inherently, it would appear, but it doesn't. So end of story. Now it takes it a little bit further. And so... The way his homeless usually explains it is his homeless says, like I said before, if, if 
the mind, if phenomena existed inherently, well, if we can accept, and the Satantics, Patantika, they're the closest to accepting, well, there is an ultimate nature of phenomena, but they still hold on to this inherent existence. So this is like way up there. It's really advanced. And like I said, as homeless deals with the most advanced level, showing us where to go, even if we're not there yet, but kind of showing us this is where we're going. So move in that direction if you can. And so here in this case, all right, let's assume there is an ultimate nature of phenomena. Let's think like the Svatantrika, there is actually this ultimate nature of phenomena. There is something, there's an ultimate truth, but we still hold on to something inherently there. If there were that ultimate truth, it would of course be, if there was this ultimate, if there were, sorry, if there was something absolutely there, if there were something inherently there, really something from the side of the object, well, when would that become obvious? Ordinarily in everyday life, Oh, certainly not, because that's not when we're analyzing. That's when we're not engaging in ultimate analysis. When will it become obvious? When we analyze phenomena, when we check, how do they really exist? That's the time we should find it. That's the time we should find that inherent existence of things. Okay? That's the moment we should find it. If phenomena existed inherently, that is the mind. That mind that realizes the ultimate nature directly, it experiences it directly, this particular meditative act of things. And if it perceives that, oh, sorry, I should say, if it really exists that way, it should perceive it because we have already determined for something to exist, there is a mind that needs to realize its existence and a conventional mind can't do it. So the only mind we're left with is the ultimate mind, but it doesn't. Even the Svatantrika says no, the, the inherently existent bath is not perceived by that mind. But then it can't exist. It can't exist. It'd be it's impossible for it to exist. How could it, sorry for that. How could it exist? How could it exist? Because it couldn't be found. How could you find this table? How could you find this table stripped of all its bits? However, that would be the absurdity. If it were to exist in and of itself, that mind would find it. And since you cannot find it, it cannot exist. But that would mean nothing could exist because if it existed inherently, the table existed inherently, a table, an inherently existent table would be the same. And if that mind, the ultimate mind, does not find the inherently existent table, in that way it refutes the inherently existent table. And if it refutes the inherently existent table, since according to the those holding onto inherent existence, a table and an inherently existent table are the same, that ultimate mind refutes a table. It realizes there's no table. It understands that nothing exists if everything existed inherently. In that moment, it would understand that. And if then, you say, well, but it was there before, before I generated that meditative act of poise. Let's say, or I, I couldn't generate it. I hold this wrong view, but let's say, okay, I do assert there is a Buddha who realizes the ultimate nature of all phenomena. And now if I agree, oh yes, it would mean that this mind realizes non-existence of all phenomena because it can't find any phenomenon, therefore nothing can exist. But previously things existed. Well, the only absurd, the only possibility would be this mind destroyed all things, which is so bizarre. This is like, it's it's kind of like, it, it's not a direct absurdity as much as like, well, that would follow and that would follow and that would follow in the sense like, well, first of all, if it existed inherently, the meditative equipoise should realize it. It should realize its non-existence. And if you then say, well, but previously things were there, then, well, then it destroyed them and you end up with this absurdity. Okay. So I just wanted to stress it one more time. Um, to be able to meditate on it, of course, effectively, and to understand, well, really what it's saying is 
understand that mind. We can generate that particular mind. We can actually ult understand ultimate reality. And if things really existed the way they appeared, it would appear clearly to that mind. Phenomena would bear analysis. And of course, what's so bizarre, of course, things would, couldn't exist at all. And that would be obvious from this particular mind, the mind that realizes the ultimate nature of all phenomena. And if we still claim, well, they were there yesterday and, and now there's an ultimate mind, the mind that realizes all phenomena and it refutes them, well, then they must have been destroyed by that mind. That's how we end up there. Okay, so I hope just saying it one more time, this is uh, hopefully leading us closer to what his holiness, of course, wants us to do, to reflect on it more, no matter how difficult it is gain an understanding of that. So in accordance with his homeless instructions. Um, and of course, then to take it further and continue with the text and hopefully uh, it'll become clearer as we go along. And so the second is the most important, as I just said, the first consequence I just talked about. The second I also mentioned that it bears logical analysis, phenomena bear logical analysis. And the third, of course, is to say, well, yeah, I deny something, I refute something. Yeah, maybe things do exist in dependence on the mind, but they also have some inherent existence. That kind of contradictory view, as the Svatantrika would hold it, yeah, they depend, but then they exist inherently. That's just impossible. Either they, they exist inherently and they exist independently, or there's no there's no two ways. You, it, they can't exist in and of themselves. In other words, have some existence, something within them that makes them a table. If there's something within them that makes them a table, you don't need a mind. You don't need causes and conditions. You don't, don't need for it to be a table. It's something within it. To make it a table that's this intrinsic there's something from the side of the table so you don't need a mind and then to say well it doesn't exist truly i've refuted its true existence it's independent its existence independent of a mind that i refuted but it still exists inherently no way you can't you can't you can't refute one and not refute the other that's what number three is the consequence that ultimate arising could not be negating. In other words, that phenomena exist, they rise in dependence on a mind, nevertheless, although they exist inherently. No, you couldn't negate that. That wouldn't make sense. All right. So hopefully the words are clear. Um, of course, that's most important here in verse 34, and this is the last time I read it, but if the intrinsic characteristics of things were to arise dependently on a mind, as the Svatantrika would say, it depends on the mind, but still it exists intrinsically, well, things would come to be destroyed by denying it. If you deny the ultimate existence, if you understand that the ultimate nature, you would destroy them. Emptiness, that is the mind that realizes the ultimate nature would be cause for the destruction of things. It would be responsible for establishing things don't exist. And if you say they existed previously and they just don't exist now, when the emptiness, when emptiness is realized by that mind, well, then the, the emptiness, the mind that realizes emptiness has destroyed these things. But this is illogical. It doesn't make sense. So no real entities exist. Okay, fast consequence. Thus, when such phenomena are analyzed, nothing is found, nothing bears, bears analysis. So here, implied in that, that would be the second consequence, that would be the second absurdity. When phenomena are analyzed, and if they do exist inherently, I should be able to find something. So the conventional truth of the everyday world should not be subjected to thorough analysis. We're just saying on an ultimate level, they cannot be found, but conventionally, they're still possible. Therefore, if existed, things exist, but just not inherently, because if they did, they would bear analysis. Now, the verse does not clearly lay this out, but it's the self-commentary that then clearly says, well, this is what I meant. That was the second um, consequence or absurdity I presented in verse 35. And then 36, in the context of suchness, certain reasoning disallows arising from self or from something other. And that same reasoning disallows them on the conventional level too. 
So on a conventional level, whether you differentiate between ultimate or conventional, there is no inherent existence as the Swatantrika likes to differentiate. So by what means is your arising established? Again, it's not directly obvious from these words. Um, it's the words basically are saying, well, on no level can you talk about inherent existence, but what uh, Chandakirti explained those to mean that if you only deny, if you only negate um, true existence, in other words, existence, um, if you deny existence independent of appearing to a mind, if you merely negate that, but you do not negate inherent existence, well, that is impossible. You can't draw that distinction. If you deny one, if you deny true existence, you're also denying inherent int intrinsic existence. And if you can't deny, if you can't refute intrinsic existence, you can't refute what you're trying to refute. And that is implied in verse 36, although from the words, it's not directly obvious. All right. But these are, so explicitly he's saying that arising from self or from other, well, that kind of uh, assertion that things exist on that level, either from self or other, well, that's neither true on the conventional nor ultimate level. So what kind of arising are you talking about? And then 37, and we've already done that last time, but just to quickly go over it before I continue with something new. Empty things, and here empty, that is empty means things that exist in one way, but appear in a different way. They depend on convergences. They depend on things coming together. Okay. Um, where is it? I'm trying to follow some of my text here. Yeah. So dependent on convergences, such as reflections and so on. So reflections in a mirror, they don't exist as a face. A reflection of a face in a mirror appears to be an actual face, but it's not. We have lots of optical illusions in everyday life. I mean, the, the, the sunrise, the sun set in the evening, that's all an optical illusion. It seems the sun is moving, but of course it isn't. Now, that's an optical illusion. It doesn't exist the way it appears. It's dependent on many factors. And still, we know about them. The, the big deal, there are lots of things around us, they function perfectly well, even though they don't exist the way they appear to us. So in the same way, just as from an empty thing like a reflection, a perfect perception can arise that bears its form, what is this saying? Just as sunset, for instance, or a reflection of a face in a mirror. It doesn't exist as a face. And the sunset doesn't exist as a sun moving around the earth. Okay, so it doesn't, ex I should put it differently. It doesn't exist as a sun setting. There's no sun that sets. There's an earth that's moving. So even though the sunset does not exist as a sun setting, still, it appears to the mind, it exists not as a sun setting, but this, what we see there in front of us exists. There's, that's, there is something happening there, right? What we call sunset, although it's not an actual movement of the sun, but the, the sun no longer being visible as part of the sunset, that's, that's reality. And so it appears in a way in which it doesn't exist. And still we can perceive it. And it serves as a cause, that scenario that's presenting itself. If you sit on the beach in Tel Aviv, is that towards west? Never mind. Um, so if you sit at the, you see the sunset. And so where we are, you see a sunset. And so in that moment, um, in that moment, you're seeing something, it doesn't exist the way it appears. And still it, ex it still it causes a perception of it. In the same way, likewise, all those things are empty. Not that we're saying, okay, a sunset doesn't exist as an actual setting of the sun, but it doesn't exist as something inherently. And still, it works. That's verse uh, 38. And still, likewise, all things, all those things are empty, just as the sunset doesn't exist as a setting sun, just as the reflection of the face in the mirror doesn't exist as a face. In the same way, all these phenomena around us, they don't exist, although they appear solid and independently, they do rise 
from emptiness in a robust way, well, in other words, because they lack inherent existence, they can arise. So from emptiness doesn't literally mean they arise. Emptiness is their cause. It's like saying form is empty, emptiness is form. We're not literally saying emptiness is the body, but we're saying because the body doesn't exist inherently, because of its emptiness, it can actually exist. If it didn't exist that way, it wouldn't be possible. So in the same way, phenomena around us, they arise, they come and go, and they can only come and go because they don't exist inherently. Things can only come into existence, so arising from self, arising from other. Well, they don't arise from other because they don't arise from inherently other. Here, other means inherently other because otherwise they wouldn't arise in the first place. So it says in 38, since no intrinsic nature exists in either of the true truth, phenomena are neither eternal nor annihilated. So this we can take back to a previous verse. It's really just saying again, if you believe, um, I think it was 33, um, 33 or 34. Um, let me think where is it? There's no, excuse me, let me see. Oh yeah, 33. It's really saying if phenomena, if, so what, what I just read these last two lines of 38. So if you were to hold that a cause and its effect are inherently different, which means an effect, if it were to arise from a cause that is inherently other, they would be so disconnected, it would be totally impossible. And you would either fall into extreme of nihilism or into the extreme of reification or permanence. Both would be, depending on the perspective, of course, it's absurd to believe that a seed and a sprout are inherently different. But if you take hypothetically the, the possibility, if you believe that the sprout exists inherently from the seed, well, the seed could never change and become a sprout. It would be permanent. The seed would exist totally independently. So no other cooperative conditions, because a seed, of course, is one of the main causes of the sprout, but it doesn't transform on its own. It's not like, and this is one of the questions that was asked quite so, quite a while ago, uh, about two weeks ago, I think it was, like saying, when we say the previous moment of, let's say, a person is the cause of the next moment of a person, isn't that oversimplistic? I'm not saying that the previous moment of a person is the only cause of the next moment of a person. There are many other causes. I'm just saying as part of the continuum, the, if I think of myself as a continuum, then yesterday's I is the cause of yesterday's today. Uh, uh, sorry, yesterday's I is the cause of today's I. Yesterday's I is the cause of today's I. But that doesn't mean that there are not many, many other causes that assisted yesterday's I in the process of becoming today's I. Dinner, for example, <laughs> last night's dinner, maybe may, it affected me as a person, my body, of course, and my mind possibly as well. And so it's the it was part of this process of yesterday's I transforming into today's I. The same is true. So we're, we're not simplistic saying that if yesterday's I is the cause of today's I, with those words, I'm not denying that they're not trillions of other causes, millions of other causes. I mean, so many other causes, direct causes, indirect causes, and so forth. So there's so many causes, of course, but I'm just trying to establish a continuum here. Likewise, with the seed and the sprout, there was a continuum, except that well, I talk about the former continuum, the former, I talk about a seed, I call it a seed, and then the later continuum, I describe it as a sprout. But really, it's just a continuation of atoms changing, just as yesterday's eye, I call yesterday's eye, and today's eye, it's today's eye. It's not the same. Okay, so seed and sprout, going back to that, the seed can only because it doesn't exist inherently that's why the seed can become the sprout 
if it existed inherently, it could not be influenced by other conditions and causes, transform to become the sprout. It would be totally independent and it wouldn't transform. So it would remain the seed. And that would mean you fall into the extreme of um, permanence, of reification. On another, seeing it from a different angle, if seed and sprout were inherently different and you were to insist, but still the sprout comes into existence, well then, well then, the seed could have not transformed to become the sprout because they're so separate. And therefore, you fall into the extreme of nihilism because the continuum of the seed would be severed. It, it would not be that the seed slowly becomes the sprout because they're inherently different. They're totally disconnected. There's no transformation of one into the other. They're like unrelated. So that would mean, therefore, you fall into extreme of nihilism. And so depending on the perspective, well, if you accept that cause and effect are inherently separate, then you fall into extreme of one, you fall into one of those two extremes. And verse 38, the last two lines are really just saying again what was said in 33 and summarizing everything before. Now, so far, I hope everything has been a little bit. I hope still clear to a certain degree in terms of what do we do just in two or three words we analyzed how does an effect come about from a cause okay dependence on causes and conditions how did this go about we haven't understood everything but i think we learned quite a bit of what chanda kirti presented but someone may say well but how do you account if phenomena don't exist inherently and that there's no inherent existent cause that gives rise to inherently existent result? I mean, come on, seed and sprout are kind of not that difficult because here's the seed and there's the sprout. And all right, at least I can see something there and maybe I can take it, I can accept it. It doesn't exist inherently. Okay, but what about a very important part of Buddhism cause and effect that's not obvious to me and where the result takes a long time to manifest how am i accounting for that and that's the next verse now the next verse is talking about this someone and this is just implied here someone is saying well okay seed and sprout are fine but if i do an action today and i leave something my mind I don't know, I killed someone, for instance, and the action is over. I've killed, I've done it, I'm done with it. I'm not detected, I don't go to prison for it. I've been able to get away with it. But that is still a cause for me, let's say in five lifetimes from now, to die prematurely. I'm not saying that dying prematurely is always the cause, it's always the result of that, but just taking that example. All right, so or I've got my past stolen. I steal in this life, I get away with it, or even if I get disciplined, but still I accumulated the karma. And so five lifetimes from now, I have my purse stolen or something else. How do it count? So someone is saying, you're saying there's no real true cause and an effect, something solidly there, as solid as it appears to me, it all becomes like really hazy. And in fact, in fact, all the different philosophical systems, they deal with that. And it's really funny how we also have a hard time to actually, to actually account for cause and effect, talking about imprints and so forth. We have all of these funny ideas about imprints, etc., that very much reflect our sense of inherent existence. As if every time we do something, we leave a little dot on our mind, something very solid, right? There's this mind and I just stole the purse and the action of the purse is over and I leave an imprint. As if someone comes and puts a stamp on my mind. That's how like, it appears really solid. It's not like that. It doesn't, it's not like that. And that is so hard to understand. And so some of the other philosophical systems, for instance, the Chitta Mantra, they say, okay, you talk about imprints, possibly in a similar fashion that we think about it. There's this, every time I leave a stamp in my mind, it's kind of like this picture we have, very solid, concrete. So where do all these stamps go? 
And if the mind is sometimes there and sometimes not, sometimes you have a coarse mind, sometimes you have a subtle mind, what happens with the imprints, these solid imprints? The person Giga school, there's no problem with it because they're not solid. They're just merely labeled. And so no big deal. But if we hold on to them as being so concrete, you need a very concrete mind. So the Chitta Matra comes up with a mind. It comes up this idea of a mind that's called alavishnaya or mind basis of all they say oh there must be besides the five sense consciousnesses and the sixth consciousness i mean they come and go sometimes you have the sense consciousnesses but when you're asleep they're no longer active and then the mental consciousness is constantly changing sometimes it's there and then it's coarser and it's subtler and it's virtues and it's non-virtues so if it's virtues what happens to all the non-virtuous imprints, right? You have a non-virtuous mind that's full of all these virtuous imprints. Uh, or what about the non-virtuous mind and the other way around? And what happens with the clear light mind? Like, what do you all do with these imprints? Kind of like needing something very solid for the imprints. And so they come up with this other mind, with this seventh mind, this mind that's always there, unchanging, doesn't recognize anything, right? Things just appear to it, but it remains neutral at all times and it holds all these imprints very comfortably from life to life to life. So it's kind of like this, it's almost like a crutch. It's so difficult to understand really how phenomena, how our actions of this life can be passed on from life to life. It's like, wow, the mind is not not something we can see, and then it's nothing inherently existent and still cause and effect works, that's difficult. So the Chitta Matra school provides this explanation. And we actually learn about it. There's a whole book by Lama Tsongkhapa only about Alavishnaya. It's been translated into English it's called Ocean of Eloquence. It was translated by Gareth Sparham. And very difficult to understand. Um, it's Lama Tsongkhapa's writing. Uh, you need to study it with someone to really understand parts of it you understand. And we did spend quite some time studying this. So you really get to know this kind of mind only to later negate it. But it's it's brilliant. It, it is, it's a brilliant idea, but it shows our mind needs these crutches. It needs this, oh, something there because otherwise things don't work. And it's just really interesting as part of recognizing our own mind. But of course, actually in this verse that's to come, um, verse, what is it, 39, actually, Lama Tsongkhapa, no, Chandakirti says, since actions do not cease in an intrinsic manner, there's no intrinsic coming into existence or actions ceasing, right? And we need to talk about what does that ceasing mean? The action is gone. So now it continues on, yes, but it remains potent. So there is what we call an imprint. It remains potent, but we don't need a foundation consciousness. We don't need this kind of crutch that there's this mind that holds all the imprints. It's not, it's not necessary. Indeed, in some cases, the acts themselves may have long ceased. Okay, in the case of like stealing this pass. So the action of stealing a pass doesn't exist inherently. When it stops, when the action is completed and the action ceases to be there, it's no longer there, even though it doesn't exist inherently, it's still very potent and can still create an experience in the future, even without this foundational, this, this mind basis of all, as the Vichita Matra believes. Indeed, in some cases, the acts themselves may have long gone long ceased so in the case of stealing a past thousand years ago thousand lifetimes ago yet the effects will come about without fail this you should know in other words to summarize it lack of inherent existence does not deny the working of the law of karma it works perfectly in fact it couldn't work if things existed inherently and that's really hard that's really hard it's the seed and the sprout is one thing, but here we're talking about something where we don't know what the mind is. That is so hard. Karma is, we could get some coarse understanding and have some belief in it, but really to get to that level and in, in combination with the lack of inherent existence is not easy. Anyway, 
we're done for now. Again, I'm five minutes too late over time. So bear with me. Let's do the meditation. Let's follow what His Holiness has taught us. We'll do the meditation again. What I did earlier on, not yet the foundation of consciousness. We go more into it next time. Um, if you've got questions, of course, as Sheer has kindly um, agreed to continue sending the questions, I try to address them. There's one question I haven't addressed yet, so please bear with me. I don't forget. Um, I just need to find the right moment to address it. Okay, and those other ones that have come, if you have more, if, if I haven't answered it yet, if you feel like there's still, you're welcome to ask again. Great. So let's do the meditation one more time on the three um, absurdities or the three consequences, starting with some breathing meditation, just to let go of any disruptive thoughts, anything that is disturbing when we do the meditation. Now remember that the existence of anything is determined by the mind. The existence of conventional truth It's determined by conventional valid cognizers. That realize their objects. Yet that are not affected by ultimate analysis. An ultimate valid, ultimate existence, ultimate truth is determined by ultimate valid cognizers. That realize their objects and that are affected by ultimate analysis. Now, if we were to hold on to phenomena existing inherently, the way they appear to us, they would have to bear ultimate analysis. In other words, we would be able to find 
an object such as a table that is stripped of its parts, stripped of a mind perceiving it, stripped of its causes and conditions, we would be able to find a solid table. Or set differently, we would be able to find a table among its parts, solid, independent table. The more we searched for the table, the clearer it would have to become. However, in fact, the opposite is the case. Also, If the table existed inherently, then the mind that realizes its ultimate nature, its ultimate mode of existence, would have to recognize it would have to perceive it. Yet that doesn't happen. No inherent table is perceived by the meditative equipoise, realizing the ultimate nature of the table. since it only perceives the non-findability. Yet if I still were to insist the table exists inherently,
and the meditative equipoise that is an ultimate valid cognizer. Or to establish the non existence of the table. And since the meditative act of poise. realizes in the non-findability of all phenomena. If phenomena existed inherently, it would absurdly follow that meditative act of poise establishes the non-existence of all phenomena. For if they existed inherently, they would have to appear to that mind. And if I believed that phenomena existed before the meditative equipoise, that would mean the meditative equipoise is the cause for the destruction of all phenomena. Since they previously existed, before the arisal of the meditative equipoise, but with the meditative equipoise, they've been established to be non-existent. Therefore, in terms of the third consequence, it does not make sense to negate a certain type of independent existence but not to negate inherent existence. As the Svatantikas do, who say that although the table doesn't exist independently of appearing to our mind, and nonetheless exists inherently. For if the, the table existed inherently, it wouldn't need a mind which it appears. It wouldn't depend on such a mind. And 
And the fourth consequence or absurdity is mentioned in the auto commentary by Chandakirti. If phenomena existed inherently, it would contradict those sutras that clearly explain that phenomena lack inherent existence, such as the Heart Sutra and others. So now in conclusion, whatever feeling has arisen in terms of the lack of inherent existence, spend a few moments just focusing on that and internalizing it. And now let's, of course, dedicate whatever positive potential we've accumulated together here. May it become a cause for our own enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. But also right now, right here and now, benefit other sentient beings who we know and who we don't know. I help those who are sick to recover very soon, like Tali Lubin and so many others. May it relieve their pain, their fear, their loneliness. And benefit them in the way Shantideva describes it. May all beings everywhere plagued by sufferings of body and mind, obtain an ocean of happiness and joy by virtue of my merits. May no living creature suffer, commit evil or ever fall ill. May no one be afraid or belittled with a mind weighed down by depression. May the blind see forms and the deaf hear sounds. May those whose bodies are worn with toil be restored on finding repose. May the naked find clothing, the hungry find food. May the thirsty find water and delicious drinks. May the poor find wealth, those weak with sorrow find joy. May the forlorn find hope, constant happiness and prosperity. May there be timely rains and bountiful harvests. May all medicines be effective and wholesome prayers bear fruit. May all who are sick and ill quickly be free from their ailments. Whatever diseases there are in the world, may they never occur again. May the frightened cease to be afraid and those bound be freed. May the powerless find power and may people think of benefiting each other. For as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain to dispel the miseries of the world. Okay, well, thank you very much. And please make an effort as you usually do with this coming week, the connection with your Lama. If you have a hard time with it, well, there's definitely the Lamrim Chemu that you can read. It's actually available online for free. I've seen it for free, so the great treatise of the stages on the stage of the path to enlightenment. Um, and anyway, you'll find other material online. Okay, have a great evening. Have a great week as well.
And I'll see you again next week. Thank you, Kishima. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Kishima. Bye. Good night. What a treat. Very much, Kishima.